be a combination of taxpayer funded, but we know that there isn't more resources available. Um, it's going to be a combination of that. It's going to be a combination of, of some insurance contributions that individuals uh, might pay. Now, how we do that, whether that's voluntary or uh, compulsory, uh, we, whether we can create the, the climate in which that can happen. And I, I think I said earlier my concern <coughs> about a voluntary system is what the take-up would be, which might help some people, but it wouldn't actually solve the problem across uh, the piece. Um, and the third area, uh, and this is the controversial one uh, in many respects, is this issue about assets and uh, income that we know for the older population, some of that older population, you have a lot of resource tied up into assets. Can we find ways of releasing those assets, uh, either through government-led initiatives or other initiatives, uh, the equity release uh, world, uh, to provide the kind of resources that people might need? Um, the, the worry about simply taking, I think, a, a wholly taxpayer-funded route through the, uh, the, the income tax model is this problem about a working-age population uh, shrinking relative to a larger, older age population. You're simply trying to impose on a shrinking number of people, if I can put it that way, uh, an increased tax burden to pay for a group of people over here who need services. And frankly, those sums simply don't add up. So we've got to find a way maybe of tapping into that resource that <coughs> older people have in terms of their assets to try and fund a system that's more equitable and more fair and more sustainable. Um, and I do think that, therefore, we should find a ways of incentivizing people uh, to perhaps make the most of their, their assets, to do that in a way that has equity, uh, 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 equality and fairness uh, about all of that. And we've heard about the North-South divide and poverty having different values. So there's real problems to solve. But I think the solution lies somewhere in that space of looking at the asset base and ways of tapping into it. And, and I don't mean inheritance tax and I don't mean capital gains tax. I mean something which is about uh, ring-fencing resources that can be available for, for social care combined with individuals uh, preparing for their own uh, older age through, the, through an insurance mechanism, if we can make that work, combined with the effective use of the taxation system and, and the deployment of those resources that link up health and social care. I haven't got an easy answer, but that's where I think, I think the solution lies in that space that I've just outlined. I, I think to continue what, what Phil was saying, what most people want is certainty. Uh, and what we've been bedeviled with in the past is uncertainty and the fact that you may be the unlucky one whose care needs are such that you, ha you, you are the one that, that ends up paying out hundreds of thousands of pounds. Um, uh, and that, that's the way that life's lottery works. But if we had something where we were all paying into it through our lives and maybe you could pay at higher rates if you wanted to buy something a bit, bit more, um, th then we would be preparing as a nation for it because you know, in Scotland, care is free. It, that comes courtesy of the taxpayer. When I was in Australia last year talking about things, somebody said to me, well, you know, we understand how care works in, in your retirement schemes, Nick, but, but what do people do when it's a question of health needs? So I said, well, that's okay. They just call the doctor or, or they do whatever's necessary. They said, but yeah, but that will cost, doesn't it? Because, of course, in Australia it does. They said, what do your residents do when they want an ambulance? I said, well, they call an ambulance. They said, over here we call a taxi because it's so much cheaper than an ambulance. Uh, to call one of those. So, so I mean, as a society, you're quite right, Phil. We've made certain choices and we've ended up where we are. Um, but you know, it's one of, the, one of the problems of the age, isn't it, that um, my children will, will frequently remind me that I'm the one that got the grant to go to university. I'm the one who's presided mm -hmm. over a house that rose in value like that just by sitting there. I'm the one that's got a, a, a final salary pension scheme, and they're the ones who are having to pay for it. So it, it's, it's tough growing up in, in the UK at the moment, isn't it, um, for that? Basically, I agree with him. <laughs> I mean, there's two or three things, really. One is that whoever pays, or however much it costs, the quality needs to be thought of. Um, the other issue is that, um, OK, um, we might be making decisions about who's going to pay, but we are paying anyway as, as citizens. But how are people who are going to be on the receiving end of the services actually going to have a voice and be heard and influence the decision making over the next few years. Um, I'm in that uh, similar interesting position where I've actually got a mother of 91 who's receiving home care. Um, I have um, children who are married and I've got grandchildren at all um, sort of uh, receipts of, of all different things throughout their life. I am as concerned about what's going to happen now to my mother as I am about my grandchildren, what's going to happen in 30, 40, 50 years, and I may not be around to see how that um, is going to pan out. So I think one size doesn't fit all. We do need to listen 
to what people's experiences have been, but also what they want for the future, given that it's a very changing world. And our assets may not be there to support the next generation, we may need them to support ourselves. I think the one thing I'd like to say is that whoever does end up paying for it, I think has a duty to explain how they're planning to do it to the patients and the public. Because I think as you touched on that uncertainty, and that causes a lot of stress and anxiety for patients about not knowing how it's going to do and exactly, because the system's very complicated and it's not going to get any simpler. I think whoever ends up paying for it, and I haven't got a simple answer to that question, but they should have a responsibility to explain it and make mm. it as simple as possible for patients and the public to access. your voice should be heard, you are um, a large part of the community, um, whether you're working age, before working age or even out of working age. Um, the, the voice for people with disabilities should be part of the whole debate um, and I think um, sometimes people forget about the individual um, in that process. They may listen to the groups but I think there's a chance as well to look at what are the other things that are affecting the individuals about the benefits etc as well as owning property or not owning property. Uh, just that I'm not sure these days quite what working age population means um, because I think one of the things we've seen is those boundaries are blurred. We will take people in our developments who are, who are 55 plus or there could be 20 years worth of working life left in that. I, I, th I think it's part of the general solution that, that we need accessible accommodation and care arrangements at all ages. I, mean, I, th I thought your, your point about all of the generations mm. is, is exactly well made. But education is free for everybody and it's unquestioned. Some care is, is not seen in the same way. It's, it's back to the choices. To take the very big picture uh, first, I, I, if you look at the cost pressures upon uh, the health and social care system uh, and the, the, uh, the, the people of working age with, with disabilities who uh, have require health and social care and other kinds of support are there, but it's not a major driver or a growing <coughs> driver of cost within the system, interestingly. The real driver is older age people, despite compression of mm. morbidities and so on, that the actual, if you look at the, the curves and the numbers and so on, what keeps uh, uh, health and treasury ministers awake at night is yeah. just looking at those, it's, it's ageing that's going to create the, the real pressures on the system. So in a way, there's, there's at that level not a problem, if I can put it that way, that uh, I think the resources are there for, for, for providing people with working age with disabilities the kind of health and social care when they need it. I particularly like the development of personal budgets as a mechanism for delivering that care because it places that uh, power and empowers the individual to control the resources they, ha they, they have and to have the things that they want and certainly when I was working uh, as, as minister with uh, working with people with learning dis disabilities um, there was a lot of resistance to the kind of changes we were making but then when we actually did give and did it well providing those resources through personal budgets the choices people made were very different from that which as it were the system mm -hmm. was making for them and, and choices for the better and we saw a real uh, uh, the idea of empowerment and people control their own lives and independence uh, I think personal budgets so there's, a, there's the issue about the amount of money and then it's how it's being delivered which makes a difference uh, just a final point that I think is the, another challenge which I don't think we really tackled is the transition from childhood to adulthood that when you're a, a child in the system there's quite a lot of support and uh, uh, resources available I'm thinking about in this case children with uh, autism as a particular mm. feature and we, we, put, we produced a, an autism bill as a result of it was what happens when a child with autism then becomes an adult and suddenly all those resources that were there aren't there the social care system simply doesn't have them available and I think we haven't really cracked the problem of um, how we predict those numbers because we know how many we've got and therefore have resources available to support people with particular kinds of um, either physical or um, mental physical uh, 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 disabilities that, that need to be addressed. I think we could be a lot better at that personally. And the main thing that we're basically seeing with social care and this is what we're anticipating being our time bomb that we're trying to produce services to not prevent, because I'm not sure we can prevent it, but to, to try and soften the blow is that we're having a lot of reports now of social care packages being paired back, so 24-7 cares for um, care packages for people with very high injuries, so maybe paralysis of all four limbs, even to the extent where they might not be able to even breathe for themselves. No longer 24-7 cares, being reassessed and said, well, maybe eight hours is good for you, we can get you out of bed, we can come back and we'll give you lunch and put you in front of Emma Dale for the afternoon, then we can come back and put you, at bed, put you into bed at six o'clock in the evening. And 
We've got um, very real concerns about our members and um, actually um, a guy that works for me, Mick, he is he's on direct <laughs> payments, he absolutely loves them. He's um, unable to care for himself, he has the independent living fund at the minute as well. And his fear is that in 2015 when the independent, loving, um, independent living fund is basically brought to an end, that he won't get the same funding for his care package and that you'll be turning somebody who has a job, mm. who is a taxpayer, who's paying into the exchequer, mm. you'll be turning him into a burden on the state. He'll no longer be able to live at home in the same way that he does at the minute. He certainly wouldn't be able to work, and he might end up in a care home or whatever. And when the government is going in one direction and saying, we want disabled people back into work, which is something that we would support mm. as long as they are able to do that, because you're always better off working than you are on, on benefits, um, but they're actually going to turn people who are able to do this into burdens on the state, and it's very concerning for us at the minute, and it's our big concern, really. One thing I meant to mention, I think the, the idea of uh, portable care assessments, okay. I think, is, uh, is something we uh, put into our white paper. I'm pleased that you know, the, the coalition have, uh, have pursued it, and it will be in the social care paper so that you don't get a different care assessment depending on which part of the country you're from or whether you live in, yes. in a different uh, urban or rural area. Yes. Now, there's going to be lots of arguments about what's in that care assessment and getting best practice and so on. And of course, how that care is delivered will be different in different areas because it's different in a rural area and an urban area and so on. Um, but certainly the idea that we don't have that part of the postcode lottery that we have at the moment, I think, is a, a definite step forward. The devil will be in the detail, of course. I would like to see us build cross-party consensus on these issues. This is a profound issue. I mean, it's like climate change. It isn't going to go away. Aging and the demographic pressures on everybody and the way the system responds and how we engage people and so on is here to stay. It's, 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 a, it's a problem that's going to address at the economic as well as at the health level. So I think if we can build consensus, I think we should try. We did, uh, people might remember, the big care debate that we held, the green paper and the white paper. That was an effort to try to build not just among the politicians, but among the community, the public, to raise awareness. Um, and I think people sort of get the problem, but it's because it's pretty tough to unpack it and break it up into chunks that people can understand and, and deal with. It's hard to really uh, uh, to take it forward. But I'm, I kind of feel optimistic that uh, as, we, as we go forward, I think there are solutions <coughs> like portable care assessments, like uh, personal budgets, like perhaps looking at the combination of taxation, insurance, and maybe something around assets, where we could find and build consensus over time. When it comes to 2015 and election, I suspect we will still get the gloves coming off and people will be uh, throwing things at one another in the way that we do, uh, in, uh, people do in, in politics, which I think is regrettable. But if we can get beyond that, um, I, I think it's up to all of us to build something that goes through not just the next general election, but the general election after that to build a sustainable system for the next 30, 40 years. That, that's the big challenge that I think policymakers have to uh, yeah. uh, aspire to achieve. Can I say, and, and where you ended, that, that's exactly the problem, isn't it? Because politics is arranged around five-year parliaments, right. uh, and it's actually not in any political party's interest to look much beyond the next election, so it stops long-term planning. I, I would wait for the day when the political party comes out and says it's actually going to cut funding to the NHS. And the reason it's going to do it is because it's going to concentrate all the resources on prevention. It's going to pour it into education for younger people. It's going to make sure that we have well-being assessments so that we get early interventions on health and we don't end up with, a, with an NHS that is basically about, can I use the word warehousing, older people in inappropriate places when actually they, they could be being looked after in their own homes. But no political party will come out and say that. Well, it's strange. You will actually get people campaigning with banners outside a hospital that's killing people. Uh, and uh, it is hard, this, and it does require cross-party consensus if we, can, if we can build it. It's not easy. Interestingly, there's research around that shows where um, individual hospitals, for example, not just trusts or larger organisations, have actually looked at what they call the, the lean thinking approach to 
um, health care, uh, which has looked at what is the demand and, and, and sort of got rid of what they call waste. And it's very much an automotive industry approach, I know, but it seems to be working quite well in, in some areas. So I think there are opportunities to look elsewhere where that has worked and, and, and move that over into some, some areas. But the other thing is as well, is that if you start listening to what your patients, for example, are saying to you, it has already shown that those that do and want to keep people safe through doing that actually save money. So you are actually eliminating some waste when you start to do those processes. Um, it's difficult to quantify a negative, I always think. You know, you can't always say what I haven't spent because. But when you start looking at what you haven't spent out in public inquiries and things like that over the last few years, that money could actually have been used and was, should be used far more in the actual preventative or the actual administration of health care. I think part of it comes down to the NHS constitution as well, which is designed to try and make the NHS more effective. Mm -hmm. And if the NHS was really effective, then waste wouldn't be such a big issue. Um, but I think that's limited because of the awareness of the NHS constitution is so low. Um, the Patients Association published a report in the summer of 2012 that highlighted just quite how low awareness was, and it was around 70 to 80 percent among patients, but also among staff as well. And it outlines both rights and responsibilities. Um, and there are responsibilities in there for patients, like cancelling appointments, mm. sorry, attending appointments or cancelling with due notice. I can't remember the exact wording. Mm. And I know there are statistics out there that show how much cost there is associated with missed appointments. And I think if the NHS constitution can become the document that France has recommended it to be, um, and as the Patients Association have suggested, a kind of Bible for patients and staff, then I think that's got the potential to start raising awareness of some of the issues that cause wastage, and hopefully people can work together to try and address them as well. First of all, the, the, a phrase that uh, I, I got thrown at me was allocative inefficiency. I'll just explain what that means. Uh, uh, which is that the, I think the NHS and indeed that and the social care system means we put a lot of money in the wrong places. The triangle's the wrong way up. Mm. In other words, we have a lot of money going into the acute system and not yep. enough money going into the uh, uh, keeping people safe and living well at home and self-managed care and so on. We've got to turn that triangle over. We're, we've got to reallocate resources. And I think if we were to do, turn that triangle over in that way, we would do a lot about not sort of waste in the sense of too many people are printing too many pages of paper out or whatever, that kind of waste. It's more about the, the inefficiency in the system, which is not putting resources where it needs to be. Uh, that's partly what we we're trying to do with social impact bonds, is use a, a funding lever to try to get that, that turning over the, of, that, of that, that triangle. So that's the first point I, I would make. Um, the second thing is, is about performance management, I, um, and I don't. I know this is not language that many people in the public sector are, are very you know, f f um, fond of, but certainly I do think we need to find out where people are doing the best practice, where they get good returns for the, their investment, and then to replicate it. And I think we could then remove waste from the system simply by getting people to perform to the, the level of, of, of the best. Um, and I do think at the moment my worry is that people are making very short-term decisions to quote, find their 20% or their 4% a year uh, reductions. Nutrition is, I think, a classic example where people are reducing their spend on things like um, you know, pre prescribed supplements and so on, because that's an easy one to, is to sort of just chop that by 5% or whatever, without thinking that a, you know, a couple of months down the line or a bit later down the line, those people are not going to get the kind of nourishment they need and therefore they're going to find themselves malnourished and then you've got huge amounts of cost being piled into the system. And that's just one example of where people are having to sort of <laughs> sit down you know, th with the accountants and sort of, well, that's an easy one to cut and get that one out, uh, and without really thinking through uh, the, the, the medium term, let alone longer term consequences. So if we're going to hunt down waste we've got to make sure we're not as it were uh, hunting down the, the easy things to, to capture which have long-term consequences that we're going to regret later on you've only got to hear the, some of the stories that people say I mean there are some bad things as well that can happen within private and thinking of the regulatory process uh, themselves looking now very much at, at some of the diagnostic services and there's some reports about that um, I think one of the problems is people don't really understand how much things cost or they're not told how much things cost. There's not real transparency about the actual nuts and bolts, um, sorry for any orthopaedic surgeons, but you know, the actual physical cost of, of how much something is so you can make a decision about where you go. The other thing is about the commissioning process and I have heard 
anecdotally um, reports about where consultants are not happy themselves about the sort of products they've had to buy or they've gone for a cheaper version of something and therefore it's, not, it's been a short-term fix with things like hip replacements and, and, and knee replacements and things like that. So I think there's, there's not enough transparency about it. There's not enough debate, therefore, about how the money's divvied up. And I think I've also heard stories where, you know, before the end of the year we've got to spend all our money, philosophy and mentality, so therefore they do go and purchase things that perhaps they, they don't necessarily need or would need something in another department, perhaps more importantly. <coughs> so it is a little bit of that's my budget within there as well happening. This country, I'm having an NHS free at the point of, of delivery is um, an absolute key thing that sort of <coughs> characterises us for who we are and how we've, how we've been. So I don't think people, any, I don't see any appetite unless it's a very small minority of people that want, that want to change that. Um, so uh, can we find ways of delivering the NHS uh, uh, f on that fundamental principle that draws on good practice wherever that good practice uh, can, can be found? So I do think that if other providers in the voluntary sector or in the private sector are doing things and doing things well and getting results and proving to, to do things with better health outcomes for reduced cost, then let's know about them. Uh, let's identify them. Uh, let's encourage them. Let's support them. Let's uh, bring them into, uh, into the NHS. And uh, I think I said earlier that, that the possibilities of more perhaps joint working in some ways, which is not privatisation, mm -hmm. that's not what we're talking about, is there ways of doing more of that uh, in local communities between all the different sectors? And I think we need to be thinking innovatively and creatively about solutions of that kind without undermining at all the fundamental principles of what the NHS stands for. And in terms of, is there, is there explanations for the kind of what you were describing in terms of costs and so on? I think it is complicated. I don't know whether when we're doing these costing and cost-benefit analysis, whether the vast amount of money that we, we spend on training up all the doctors and, and the nurses that are then working in these different settings, whether that's included in the, the cost of uh, uh, when, we do, when we make those judgments. It's, it's a good question. And, of course, uh, an acute hospital that's got a range of uh, uh, services, including an A&E department, is going to have a whole different cost and uh, spend base than a hospital that's just providing one particular kind of service of uh, knee replacements or whatever it might be. So are we comparing like to like is a, a very important part of, of, of getting the analysis right so that we know really what we are, what we are discussing. But, but in principle, I think we should be looking for best practice where it is and then trying to bring that into and scale it across the whole of the, the NHS because that's what is going to help us make make the most of and deal with these pressures. We're quite attracted by the new proposals in thinking how, you know, given that revenue is tight for us from the traditional sources of, of care money and housing related support money, whether, whether there is money we can pull in from GP practices, clinical commissioning groups or whatever, because we've got a range of facilities that would be of benefit to people in, in the community which would also help to make our, our establishments much more sort of community-based than, 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 than perhaps they're seen. You know, one barrier to that is, is that when you're talking about a facility where most people have bought their way in, you, you have to say to them, well, you did realise, didn't you, when you bought your apartment, that we were going to share this with half the neighbourhood. But you can get over that, you know, and you can present it as a win-win because, you know, costs coming in mean you can reduce costs to other people. So I think that's important. But, but if we can just sort of move from health to care and think, well, is that private or public? I'm not sure, really because a lot of local authorities don't provide their own care homes anymore, but they are an enormous purchaser mm -hmm. of, of care places mm -hmm. from people who are presumably part of your association, mm -hmm. Sheila. Uh, and when you've got a monopoly purchaser, you were, you were talking about it before, of how that sort of drives the price down to the point where the supply becomes, if I can run a dangerous analogy now, a bit like the way the supermarkets control the, um, the food chains that come into them. You sort of say, well, we're only going to pay this. So in the end, you only get that, which is where the quality tends to disappear, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Uh, well, Nick, and your point, if we merge the health and social care system, you're merging essentially a very public sector yes. commissioned and delivered with, uh, what was it Sheila said earlier, 17,000 uh, care homes that are in the, that are in the private or voluntary yeah. sector. You would, in effect, create <laughs> a combined public and private and voluntary sector through that integration uh, of its own uh, right. So uh, uh, the, the <laughs> people are calling for health and social care integration are also actually calling for a very different way of thinking and looking about how our health service, the NHS and social care, will look in the future. I, I like that, I think it's ambitious, but uh, be careful what you wish for because that's going to take you in a very different place when it comes to the kind of uh, providers that will be uh, meeting your needs when you're older. And I think it's um, about where that care is being provided as well. So it's 
looking at the person holistically and not just the medical thing that's happening, but also actually their whole holistic well-being will be better if, that's, if they have the adaptions. And I think that's where, um, and Nicola and I are going to talk about it in the next session after, after <coughs> tea, is that that social and psychological well-being needs to be valued equally as the medical well-being, because then I think the funding should reflect that. And at the moment, I think, by your stories, it doesn't. Um, but if we do have integrated care, then to me, integrated care is the biological, the social, and the psychological. And under that model, I think adaptions that enable you to have more independence should, should become part of that. Many of the calls that, that the Patients Association get, or if you look at complaints of, of local authorities and health services, are around the delays that are caused. And some of the things I will touch on a bit later on this afternoon is, is those delays actually have a massive effect on people's uh, illness rate or rate of recovery or not recovery and how the well-being is. So it is equally important to make sure that um, those delays are minimised as much as possible. And just to say, I think one of the worst parts of that is the battles that go on oh when yes. ad uh, adaptations are identified. As, is it the, the tenant or the owner that's going to pay for it? Mm -hmm. Is it the landlord that's yes. going to pay? Is it the local authority through a dis what's the, what's the, the dis disabled round, facilities grant round, that's going yes. to pay, which always seems to perpetually run out mm -hmm. uh, and never be enough? And there's so much time and energy mm -hmm. consumed with that when all the time the money saved on having the person out of the bed, which is I think the point you were making, uh, would yeah. probably yeah. cover that. Yeah. Yeah. Which is yeah. hopeless, isn't it? Just one final point, because I agree with that. The, uh, the reablement cash, of course, was a very clever mechanism for doing this. This was NHS money um, that was given to provide essentially social care reablement for people. Um, and uh, I remember setting this up, and it's now happening, which is, which is great, which is a way of getting some NHS cash out to deliver social care uh, mm -hmm. solutions, because that prevents people going back in, into hospital. And um, uh, we did it that way, because if we'd have given the money through the formula to local authorities, we'd never, we would never have seen it being mm -hmm. spent on those resources. It could have gone into filling potholes or anything else. So by ring-fencing it, taking it out of the initiation, putting it raving with money. So uh, whilst there's a macro problem that we have to solve, I think at a micro level, that's a good example of how we can use the system if we're intelligent about it to get NHS money to do essentially social care investment yeah. that benefits the NHS. Yeah.